Film director Nicholas Ray was a romantic figure in Hollywood of the 50s, around whom a cult is growing in the 70s. Nick Ray, the poet of anguish and violence, did very personal work, and despite some classy trash, made seminal films like They Live by Night, On Dangerous Ground, and the Baroque Western Johnny Guitar. On the outside, Ray had the tough guy charm of his drinking buddy, Humphrey Bogart. Inside, the anguished sensitivity of his friend, James Dean, a contradiction that helped Ray shape both actors into bravura performances. For Bogey, it was knock on any door and in a lonely place. For Dean, rebel without a cause. In little more than a decade, Nick Ray made 20 films about anti-heroes whose inner doubts rebelled against hostile surroundings and injustice. His love relationships were often carved out of pure mutual distrust. If sometimes he made films to please the front office, it was just playing their game to get the crack at a few real pictures of his own. In 1959, to pursue artistic freedom and escape a kind of personal bankruptcy, Ray took up independent production in Europe, which resulted in epics like 55 Days at Peking. Ray has always looked to the future. Long before it became commonplace, he dealt with drug abuse, threats to ecology, and the futility of war heroics. Most of all, his work stands out for its prophetic examination of the troubled youth culture, a concern that continues to this day with his busy schedule of teaching and guest lecturing on campuses. Meanwhile, he is preparing for a new film. Mr. Ray, Nick, welcome to Camera 3. I like the piece you did for the voice, Cliff. Thank you very much. The last one. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk to you about that a little later. But there's something that I want to talk, about you for, talk to you about first. Uh, 22 years ago, you made Rebel Without a Cause, now a film classic. Do you ever get tired of answering questions about it? No, I, no, I really don't. The, the, generally, the people who ask have a genuine interest, or it, for some very good reasons, it still relates to today. Uh, I don't get tired of it. I, I get a little bored with the curiosity seekers and the, you know, the nitpickers and, and uh, uh, things that are irrelevant to the conversation or the topic at hand. Uh, I try to stick to the subject, which I hope I can do here. Well, you mentioned my piece in the voice. Yeah. Um, the feeling that I always have is, my gosh, that's ancient history, even though it's on the stands today. Um, do you feel that way about Rebel? So much of your work is future-looking. You're a man who's always written and done films about things that are 10 years ahead of us in terms of important matters to our society. Ecology, for example. Well, that's, that, that, that's, uh... Schulberg deserves the credit for that. He, he was, he, I directed it, but Schulberg was the one who had the foresight and the vision on it. Well, then if you're going to be patient with me, let me ask you a little bit about Rebel. Uh, how did a script, or how rather did the idea for a film about gang wars? Well, I, I uh, uh, my agent at the time, Lou Wasserman, uh, came over to my house because I, I'd said, Lou, I made uh, three films for bread and taxes now. Uh, I want I want to make a film, you know, that I love. He said, well, What do you want to do? I said, Well, there's six productions of War and Peace that are scheduled, so I'd I've given that up. I want to do a film about kids. I said, I, I want to do a film about the young people next door, the middle class kid. I've I've done the the stuff of the depressed areas, the misfits. Uh, now, now I want to. Now I want to do a film about the guy next door, like like could be one of my sons. You know? What's happening with kids today? Was that right? The, right. The and that's the way. I, that's the way I feel about about the uh, discussions of old films as well. I, you know, I. Fine, so long as we can keep it relevant to today. I, I, uh, uh, I love the archives. I think they ought to be continued. I was deeply grieved when 
Henri Langlois died, uh, who established the Cinematheque in Paris. But I like to live in the now and prepare for the future, you know? But here you were, this nice German boy from La Crosse, Wisconsin. German Ooh. Norwegian. German Norwegian, I'm sorry, that's right. Your, your mother's Norwegian and my father's Norwegian, that's right. But here you were with a history of being an actor and then a director in, uh, in the tradition of the group theater. You had directed uh, Mary Martin in Lutzong, came out to California with Ilya Kazan to assist on, help me, uh, Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Broken, uh, You've made several films, and I'd like to get into some of those later, but what did you know about youth gangs? Well, I'd been a member of a youth gang. I'd also been the... the in La Crosse, Wisconsin. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, sure. The gang was very important, it's, and it still is important to... Uh, in, in a growing up sense, it's also important on the other side of the law as well. But uh, I was the president of an illegal fraternity in high school. Uh, uh, the boy and his gang was, a, was a, uh, as much a sociological factor when I was growing up as it is now. I, I, uh, I loved the adventures. You did some preparation. You looked around. You were in Los Angeles at the time. <coughs> no. <coughs> you did some homework on kids. Oh, hell yes. I did homework on my own kids. I had two wonderful sons and daughters. But, uh, uh, the one was about the age of Plato in the film at that time. The and, Salomonio. Yeah, yeah, right. Which and would be about 16? 15. And I, I uh, got in touch with the head of the toughest gang in Hollywood, which was a Hollywood high gang. And the leader of that gang was Frank Mazzola, who is now one of the best editors in Hollywood. And he took me on gang wars with him. And the kids accepted me. I carried a minophone in my, in my uh, uh, coat pocket. A minophone? A minophone was a wire recorder then. Now it's a tape recorder. And it had, I had a wristwatch for a mic, a tie clasp for a mic, a pocket drop for a mic. And Typical Watergate <clears throat> stuff, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. It had been developed by Germany during the war for espionage, like the Minox camera. And uh, uh, I remember one time we went on a, on a, a rumble, and, and uh, Frank said, hey, what do you got in your pocket? Because it, you wore it like a holster, you know? It looks as though I had a gun. These guys were very, they were very tough. But no guns were allowed, no booze was allowed, no pot was allowed, only tire chains. No knives, you know? They were very rough guys. Well, then, having done this research, uh, you sat down and wrote a screenplay? I wrote the, Treatment? I wrote the screenplay as the, or I wrote the original story in one night. Uh, when Wasserman heard, you know, knew I was serious about wanting to do a film about young people. He went to Warner Brothers. They sent me two scripts, and again, they were in depressed areas. I said, no, I didn't mean this at all, not at all. And he called me and said, Warners want to know what you do mean, you know? So will you go up and talk to them? I went up and talked to them and reported to Lou. He called me about 4 o'clock that afternoon and said, hey, they want to know if you, what you told me, if you can put down on paper what you told them. I said, I'll try. I called my secretary. She came over at 7 o'clock that night. We wrote all night. 9 o'clock, she typed it up, got it over to MCA, and Wasserman took it out to Warner Brothers at 4 o'clock that afternoon. He called and said, you've got a deal. Go out and pick your producer. Now, was, was the, the rough idea of dealing realistically with uh, the world of young people um, a hot idea at the time because, I guess, just a few months before we had had uh, Blackboard Jungle. No, they, they're too close in time, aren't they? That had hardly... It hadn't been released yet. But that wasn't paving the way for you. Oh, hell no. This was a brand new idea. It certainly took an act of business courage on Wasserman's part. Well, more courage on Warner Brothers. I was shooting for two weeks, and they... they uh, I got, a, again, a call from Wasserman and said, Hey, w Warner's want to stop the film. They want to close it out. I said, Why? 
You said, they don't know what the hell you're doing. They don't understand it. I said, Lou, tell them to close me out right away and give me 24 hours to buy the film. I sent a letter to my business manager, and uh, that night, Warners apparently went down and checked with a projectionist who said it was the only good film there was on the lot. That changed his mind, unfortunately, or else I would have owned the thing. Also, Rebel Without a Cause came at a time when uh, ho the Hollywood studio system was in collapse. Um, just upping the stakes, wasn't it, for them to try a film about juvenile delinquents, middle-class juvenile delinquents at that, suburban ju juvenile delinquents? Well, you know... Money was tightening up? Sure, but... but Fewer uh, films were being made? Yeah, but Warner's was an adventurous studio in, in, in different periods. It, it had been a, a very productive studio. And they're not idiots, you know. Uh, they, they, uh, they try hard to be at times. <laughs> All of them do. And they think they're following cycles, but it's the innovative film that usually makes the money and prepares the road for other films. Where'd you meet Jimmy Dean? I met him in, as uh, Kazan was scoring East of Eden. And uh, I didn't know it until much, much later. But I, I had a, an office suite right next to Kazan's suite at Warner's, and this fellow came in and uh, kind of sniffed around. We kind of sniffed each other, you know, and I was just preparing the screenplay. I had nobody in mind for casting. And uh, we were like a couple Siamese cats. You know? and, uh, uh, and it developed uh, much later I learned that Kazan had told Dean there are only three directors in Hollywood he should work with. Himself, George Stevens, and me. Right. Turned out those were, in yeah. fact, the Turned only three that, that yeah. he worked with. Yeah. Right. The, uh, the history of Dean shows us that uh, he had a tremendous longing to have some kind of father relationship completed, something apparently he didn't, uh, he didn't have in his youth. Do you think he saw you as a father image? Yes, not so much as Farley Granger had in They Live By Night, which became a problem of transference. I had to transfer that kind of thing over to, to Flippin'. But uh, uh, Dean did, for instance, uh, he felt the need at one point of going to a shrink, and he knew that I was going to a shrink, and said, tell me who you're going to. I want to go to the same man. Shrink shopping. Yeah, and I said, I'm not about to tell you which one. I'll give you the names of four or five of the most reputable in Southern California, and you, you choose your own. And he did, and he ended up with the same one I had. During the making of the film? Right immediately, yes, right almost toward the last week. So that at least at the end of the film, you had a double connection, both direct actor-director and through? Not through the shrink. That's completely separate. He didn't know that I knew. No, but certainly something that the shrink, that your psychiatrist, was imparting to you was also helping Dean, I would think. That, is, that isn't, no, that isn't the way they work. And, and, and he, he was going there just too short a time for maybe only had two or three visits maximum. Dean the legend. Jimmy Dean, the legend. Was he like his publicity? Was he moody? Moody, he had beautiful moods, wonderful moods, gay, joyous, happy moods. He would, he'd, he'd get into a, a, a period of exasperation, but it was usually with himself, uh, with the notable exception of Warner Brothers, because they, for insurance reasons, had told him he could no longer live in the, on the studio grounds, and they were going to close the dressing room he lived in. He loved the security of those walls around him because, he, he, you know, pe people of his generation, his age, was, you know, all of the, all of the, 
the, the parasites, all, you know, they, they were all gathering around. At the same time, they'd be setting him down because he had a job. Yet he lived confused. right out in the open in a five-floor walk-up in uh, Manhattan. In New York, yes. But it, was, but it was also, that was almost a sanctuary. Uh, I remember our, my first time I went up there to, I'd come to, to New York. I'd by this time become very interested in him. And, and I came to New York and I, I'd put him together with my son, who was Sal's age, to see how he reacted to a, a, a youth of that age. And it was wonderful. And I went up to the fifth floor, uh, fifth floor uh, walk up that he was in, and here was the poster of the Matador. Here were uh, kind of wonderful uh, automobile racing shots, sailing shots. Bongo drums. Bongo drums. Was that and news hanging and from the, the score of Harold Through Italy of Berlioz, which he was studying assiduously. Partly, I think, due to the influence of Leonard Rosenman. Who scored both your and Kazan's, Kazan's film, film. Right. Gilly Kazan's film. He's to be and I think the, brilliant. Work. I think Lenny also, he just got an award for Bound for Glory, which I think he picked up in my apartment at the Chateau for the first time, the copy Woody had given me. Hmm. Was Dean ever uh, temperamental to work with? He had temperament. He was never irresponsibly temper uh, temperamental, but he had temperament. And it was very workable temperament. In his short career, he made <laughs> just three films. And um, however affecting East of Eden may be, and it's had tremendous criti uh, critical acclaim, I think there's a consensus that your film, the work that he did in your film, was his finest work. Obviously, you had some kind of extra communication, or how did... We, we seemed to, I, I, uh, uh, like Kazan, I'd also been an actor. Uh, I really think directors who have not had the experience of acting are, are crippled to some degree. But it, it helped, it helped both of us. I know he admired Kazan a great deal, but the director has to help an actor contribute, you know? It's one of his functions. Your use of improvisation is, uh, is well known. Now, I guess Dean was really tuned into that. How, how did that work? You sometimes yeah. did a scene without a script, or? Oh, oh certainly. Well, I, I, one time I made a film with Mitchum, he says we had 17 pages of script. The Lusty Men, we actually had almost 30 pages. Uh, yeah, I, I was pretty good at that. What, for example, in, uh, in Rebel was pure improvisation? Can you think of a moment? Oh, there are a lot of moments. I, uh, one that comes immediately to mind is the... There was a scene when he comes home after the Chicky run. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, in the, in the dead of night. And... and uh, the scene was written by Stuart Stern, who had done a beautiful screenplay, did the final screenplay. But the scene when he came home took place in his mother's bedroom. And as we were approaching doing the scene, it was beginning to get on my nerves. It was too claustrophobic. It, it did not help me show some of the turmoil that was in Dean at that time. So I, I said, Jimmy, come on over to the uh, house tonight, will you? I, I want to try something. I'm, I'm, I want to do something about that scene. And this we would often do, and on weekends, he and Natalie and Sal, Corey Allen would come over. And we'd do a lot of work at the house and away from the studio. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, I said, Jim, now, here, you know, here are the conditions. Now, you come to your home, and you have one action. You want to get upstairs without being seen, without being heard, without a confrontation. But yet you got to spill your guts out to somebody. You have to talk to somebody. Now, I'm going to play your father. 
And I want you to go out and come through the back doors if you just come from the garage. And and uh, I said, I'm, I'm going to be sitting here as your father. And I went over, sat down. I, first, I went over to the TV set <clears throat> and turned it onto a dead channel so he'd have more of the feeling of, of being late at night and sleep. And I keep one eye open, catch what he's doing. And Jimmy comes in, comes past me, and and I don't see the milk bottle at this time, but he tiptoes past me. He can't quite decide whether to go up, keep on going, and he goes to the couch, and then I see the milk bottle cooling his head, you know? And then he gets onto the couch, and he very quietly puts the milk bottle on the, on the coffee table. And I watch him. And he lies down, and he hangs his head over. And I yell out, your mother's at the top of the stairs. Jimmy, Jimmy, you're home. And he gets up. And as he got up, it gave me the idea of the 180-degree uh, turn yes. of the camera, yes. which then comes upright as his mother Starts comes down, down, right, and, and comes, comes down right to him. Yes. Which is something that I, I try to do in film anyway. I try to put the camera where, in, in the position of an actor, as soon as I can, so that I always have a point of view in a scene sometimes several points of view. It helps intensify the conflict. And, and it really gives me another actor, because then the camera can act for me. You and Dean were so in tune with each other. And apparently, you were able to use all of those elements in his ambiguous personality. Um, it's, it's impossible to see East of Eden without realizing that you did something there. Did I say East of Eden? Look yeah, at that. Yeah. Rebel Without a Cause where you used uh, what is probably Dean's bisexuality in a scene with uh, Sal Minio, the ambiguous side of his nature, uh, sexually. Do you know the one I mean in the... Uh, in the alley? Yeah. Well, there were several... Uh, there were quite a few moments of that reaching out. And I'm not sure whether you mean the bisexuality of Jim or the bisexuality of Sal or the bisexuality of myself, or of anybody else. The, you know, uh, this is, this is uh, at least now, uh, uh, perhaps as a result of some work like this and, and, and the behaviors of certain people, uh, I am not bisexual. But the, uh, anyone who denies having had a fantasy or a daydream denies having eaten a bowl of potatoes, mashed potatoes. You know, it has the same reality. But you used that in the film. Was there any... It was a first of some sort. Was there any problem about, about putting it in? No the, problem. No problem at all. As I said, Warners didn't know what the hell I was doing and didn't understand what I was doing anyway. Yeah. Well, after I finished the scene, I was very happy. The scene in the alley. Uh, and, and I remember telling Jimmy, geez, I like that scene. You know, I think they're going to like it in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think anybody would pick up on it in the States. You know? you know, one of the themes that runs through your work, Nick, is a sympathy for the outcast. And it was never more graphically shown, I think, than in your first film, They Live by Night, uh, which was made well, most recently into Thieves Like Us. It was a Romeo and Juliet story, wasn't it? Doomed lovers right. on the lamb. Right. And then that theme carries through so much more. Uh, knock on any door, where you have the, again, the doomed convict with uh, Bogart. Now, that was your first Bogart film. You did yeah. two together. When you say misfits, um... Not fitting into the surroundings where they're living. You know, the, the, the working title of nearly every poem, 
play, short story, any screenplay, anything I've ever written has been I'm a stranger here myself. I'll... Misfits, misfits if, you, if you wish. John Huston made a hell of a good film with that title. Not as good as The Lusty Man, but it was a very good film. You're very busy these days, I know. Um, guest lecturing, teaching. Mm -hmm. You're currently at the uh, Lee Strasberg School here in Manhattan. And you're going to be working at NYU this, this coming summer. Right. How do you like working with youth? It's been a preoccupation, another one, in your work all these years. Well, I hope it continues. I, I, uh, it's one way of keeping in touch with reality and fantasy at the same time. Not that you can't do it with my own peers, uh, but I don't particularly care for my generation. Uh, the absence of achievement is pretty notable on, a, on very deep levels. Uh, I like the promise. I, you know, I like the. I like the promise. I like the hope. I, I enjoy doing what I'm doing very much, and I enjoy preparing for the next thing. I enjoy acting. I enjoy everything in the theater. The celluloid strip is a bloodstream for me, you know. And so is youth. It's, it's what I live by. Nick, if you had the first twenty to make over again. Did you do anything differently? Oh, sure, there are a few, and I'm glad you mentioned a few of those that I wouldn't like to change a hundred things in. But a lot of them I'd like to, you know, if I had any interest in the past, I, I, don't, I don't, I have, I have this kind of interest. I don't want to make the same mistakes again. I don't want to go down that schizophrenic path, you know. Um, but, um, you know, I, uh, there are times I could have extended myself more. I took a lot of chances. They all seemed to work. All the films made money. Uh, so, so why, you know, why labor it? Uh, I, I love making film, you know. I, I, I just, Well, you're going to have to put aside this acting, lecturing, and teaching to I get on the new film. I don't intend to put anything aside. <laughs> Nothing. I just keep going. The, the, um, I, I had two people quit me once, and I had formed a company in overseas. They said, we don't want to be members of the Nick Ray 50-hour club anymore. Because I wouldn't hire a secretary until, unless she could go around the clock. I'm, I'm, that insanity is over, you know. And it was insanity. I work much better now. I like myself better now. Gabby Pascal, one.